We've already been over how linear accelerators generate their high beam energies. In this video I'm going to be going over how we make these beams clinically useful. It's going to involve discussing the components within the linear accelerator treatment hem and how each one affects the beam before it strikes the patient. When the high energy electron beam exits an accelerating waveguide, it's generally not pointing at the patient, it's moving parallel to the floor. The first component of the treatment head is a bending magnet, which points the beam towards the patient. Below this is an X-ray target, which can be put in the way of an electron beam if we want to turn it into a photon beam, or pulled out of the way if we want to treat with an electron beam instead. This part of the treatment head also contains a primary collimator. A collimator is something that shapes a beam. In this case, it's a lump of heavy metal with a hole in the middle for the beam to pass through. It acts as shielding by stopping scattered radiation from escaping from the treatment head. Beneath this is a rotating wheel or carousel which contains a number of components which can be cycled in and out of the beam depending on what we want to do with it. If we want to treat with an electron beam, the target is pulled out of the way, and the thin electron beam that emerges from the bending magnet strikes a scattering coil within the carousel, which spreads the beam out to a clinically useful wide shape. If we want to treat with a photon beam, the target moves in, and we rotate the carousel to move a flattening filter in the way. This gives the photon beam a more uniform profile. The beam then passes through a monitor chamber, which is a radiation detector that allows us to determine how much radiation is leaving the treatment. And this allows us to choose a dose to deliver to our patient, and after the machine has measured a certain amount leaving the treatment head, it will turn off. Beneath this, we collimate or shape the field with a set of jaws, or mobile radiation shields. Depending on the machine design and the type of treatment, beneath this we might also shape the field further with a multi-leaf collimator, or an electron applicator if we're delivering an electron treatment. I'm going to be discussing all of these components in more detail over the next few slides, although the multi-leaf collimator, or MLC, will have a tutorial of its own later on. The job of the bending magnet is to point the beam at the patient. In order to do this, we like to use electromagnets, because when you pass electrons through a magnetic field, they tend to follow a circular path. And also, electromagnets allow us to adjust field strength, and different energies of electron beam require different strengths in the magnetic field, since more energetic electrons are tougher to bend. So electromagnets are good if you're going to be using multiple beam energies. An obvious way to redirect the beam would be to turn it 90 degrees to face the patient. The problem with this approach is that more energetic electrons are more difficult to deflect, and less energetic electrons are easier to deflect. So the magnet tends to wind up splitting them with more energetic electrons further from the source and less energetic electrons closer to the source. This is quite undesirable as spreading the beam out early like this results in a blurry beam edge inside the patient, which can result in unnecessary dose outside of our targets. It also results in an uneven spread of energy within the patient as well, which can result in a heel effect, like the one I discussed in the video on principles of kilovoltage machine operation. Basically, you wind up with a higher dose on one side of the field, which makes it higher to treat targets in a uniform fashion. Linux produced by varying medical systems tend to use a 270 degree bending magnet instead, so it moves the incident electron beam through three quarters of a circle in order to point it at the patient, rather than just a 90 degree bend. This does separate the beam somewhat according to energy as well, with higher energy electrons moving through a bigger circle because they're more difficult to deflect, and lower energy electrons moving through a smaller circle because they're easier to deflect. But the 270 degree bending design allows us to refocus these components onto one point, on the X-ray target, or electron scattering point. So this way they're not separated according to energy, so there's no heel effect. And they're focused on a very small point, which allows us to obtain a very sharp beam edge. Because the electron beam is separated into different energy components, we can pass it through an aperture which allows us to actually select the very specific energies. Because ones that are too low energy will hit this side of the aperture and won't make it through to the rest of the treatment head. The ones that are too high energy will hit this side of the aperture. This allows us to limit the spread of energy within our beam to approximately 2%. Thanks to this aperture, we can also adjust the strength of this magnetic field slightly in order to select for slightly different energy, so we can fine-tune the energy of the beam if we wish. If we reduce this field strength, then electrons will tend to move more this way, so lower energy components will be more likely to make it through the aperture. If we increase the strength of the magnetic field, then more energetic electrons are going to be bent more this way, so they'll make it through the aperture instead. So they'll make it through the aperture, whereas lower energy electrons won't. I'm no expert on electrolinux, but they use a slightly different system, which is known as a slalom design. So it's a system of three different magnets that bends the beam like this. The electron beam that emerges from the bending magnet is quite thin, so we call it a pencil beam. If we want to use it to generate a photon beam, we need to force it to undergo the bohm strahlin interaction. So we make it collide with an X-ray target, which is essentially a chunk of metal. You may remember from the tube on electron interactions that the bohm strahlin interaction becomes more likely as the atomic number of the material through which the electron beam is passing increases. So you get more photons per electron with a higher atomic number material. So we do often use high atomic number materials like tungsten for X-ray targets. Tungsten is also a good choice because it's quite durable, and the electron beams used to generate photon beams tend to be quite intense and can cause quite a lot of damage to soft materials. 
In fact, they're so intense that if they strike a person, they feel an electric shock, or feel like they've spilled hot coffee on themselves. But also thinking back to the Chuhong photon interactions, in a high atomic number material, when the beam energy is very high, you also get a lot of pair production. This can decrease the energy of the beam that's being produced via beam softening, which is undesirable. So when producing very high energy photon beams, such as 15 MV and above, we tend to use a low atomic number target material like aluminium. This helps to keep the beam energy high, even if it is less efficient in terms of the number of photons produced. But for lower energy beams, we don't have to worry so much about beam softening, because the pair production interaction is more rare. So we can use high atomic number materials like tungsten. So in a dual photon energy machine, as most linear accelerators are, each photon beam energy will have a separate target. Targets also tend to have a copper backing as well. This ensures that all of the incident electron pencil beam is absorbed. This is because it's pointed directly at the patient, and any electrons making it through the target are going to result in unnecessary dose to the patient's skin. And when using LINAC photon beams, the goal is generally to treat deep structures, so skin dose is undesirable. If we want to use a LINAC to produce a clinical electron beam, we move the X-ray target out of the way. The electrons at this point are still in the form of a pencil beam, which is not very clinically useful at all, so it's much thinner than most of the targets we want to treat. So we convert it into a more broad and clinically useful shape using scattering foils a bit further down in the treatment head. Varian accelerators use something called a dual scattering foil, which is exactly what it sounds like. It consists of two thin pieces of metal which spread out the beam by scattering. The beam hits one layer, and is spread out a bit, then hits a second layer, which further adjusts its shape. If we look at a profile across the pencil beam, so the number of electrons versus distance across the beam, it's quite narrow. But hitting the first scattering foil spreads it out significantly, into a Gaussian shape, or that of a normal distribution. This happens because electrons are more likely to be scattered a little bit than they are to be scattered a lot, so you tend to wind up with more close to the center and fewer further away. The job of the second foil is to generate a more uniform profile by scattering electrons from the edges of the beam into the center, and electrons from the center of the beam towards the edges. We like to have flat beams because it means that we can give a fairly high and uniform dose to a target, which gives us a good chance of killing everything inside it, and a low dose outside of it. Whereas if we had a less flat Gaussian shaped beam, in order to get the same minimum dose inside the target, we'd have to give a lot of extra dose to the surrounding tissue. Thinking back to the electron interactions chewed again, remember that high energy electron beams undergoing the bram straling interaction tend to produce more photons in the forward direction than they do off to the sides. If we look at a profile across this beam, so the number of photons versus distance across the beam, we see that there are a lot more photons in the middle of the beam than there are in the edges. And historically at least, in photon beams we like to have a flat beam, because it makes it easier to give a uniform coverage of the target while sparing surrounding tissues. So we pass this beam that has more photons in the middle through a filter that's thicker in the middle. So more photons are absorbed from the center of the beam than they are from the edges, so this flattens out the beam, so therefore we call this a flattening filter. These filters are precisely shaped in order to reflect the profile of the incident beam, so they need to be different for each beam energy, since each energy is going to prefer to produce photons at different angles. So higher energy photon beams are going to be more forward peak than lower energy photon beams, so the filter shape is going to need to be different too. The idea here is that more intense parts of the beam pass through a greater thickness of filter material and experience more attenuation. This results in beam hardening, since the lower energy components of the beam are attenuated more readily within the filter than the higher energy components. So the center of the beam tends to have a higher energy than the edges of the beam. This is responsible for something called dose horns, which we see when looking at dose profiles inside patients. Dose horns are visible at shallow depths, say around about 1.5 cm. They are just little peaks in dose either side of the center of the beam. This is because these regions of the beam have a lower energy, and therefore they deposit more dose at a shallower depth. The center of the beam has a higher energy, so it deposits less dose at a shallower depth. If we look a bit deeper, say at 10 cm depth, the beam is relatively flat. That's because the lower energy parts of the beam closer to the edges have been attenuated more than the center as they pass through our rectangular patient, and the center of the beam, which is higher energy, has been attenuated less. And it's no coincidence that this happens at around about 10 cm depth, because the filters are actually designed this way in order to produce a flat beam profile at the depth that we're likely to want to treat. 10 cm is a depth that's often chosen as representative of where we might expect to find the target. If we look even deeper, say at 15 cm depth, you notice that the dose is actually lower at the field edges. That's because these lower energy regions of the beam have been attenuated more than the center of the beam at this depth. These flattening filters absorb a significant portion of the beam, so they reduce the dose rate considerably. If you take the flattening filter out of the beam, you can get a dose rate about four times higher. A lot of the beam also scatters as it passes through the flattening filter, which can result in dose outside of the field, which isn't great for the patient. Flattening filters were historically quite necessary in order to obtain uniform, 
clinically useful beams, but with the introduction of intensity modulated treaters, they're no longer quite so necessary. But on the other hand, they are the default option for most medical linear accelerators. So unless you're delivering treatments that require an extremely high dose or dose rate, there's not necessarily a lot to be gained from removing them either. Below the scattering foil or flattening filter is a monitor chamber. The monitor chamber is an ionization chamber, which is a device for measuring amounts of radiation. The beam passes through it before it leaves the treatment head, allowing the monitor chamber to keep track of the amount of radiation that's leaving the limit. This allows us to preset how much radiation we want to deliver using a given beam. By telling the machine to shut off after the monitor chamber measures a certain amount of radiation, the monitor chamber measures radiation in monitor units, or MU for short. So when setting up a patient treatment, we might program a machine to deliver, say, 100 monitor units. The monitor unit tells us how much radiation is coming out of here. But the amount of dose absorbed from this beam by a target depends upon a lot of things that happen outside of the treatment head. For example, how far away it is from the radiation source, since radiation drops off at distance. How deep inside the patient it is, since dose varies with the depth traveled by a beam through a patient. It even varies with the size of the beam that we use. Discussing all of these variables is another tube in itself, and will be discussed in more detail later. But in order to determine how much an MU is worth, we would take a measurement inside a geometry like this one. Popular choice is to do it 100 centimeters away from the radiation source, and a depth of a few centimeters in water, which is regarded as equivalent to human tissue. We adjust the amount of radiation that comes out of the machine per monitor unit, so that 100 monitor units deliver a dose of 1 gray. So 1 monitor unit is usually equal to 1 centigrade. Setting this value is the process of beam calibration or absolute dissymmetry. This relationship is only true for the same distance, depth, and beam size that we use during this measurement in which we set this value. But we can adjust for any changes in these conditions through a process known as relative dissymmetry, which I'll go into in a future tutorial. Linear accelerators need to use monitor chambers because the rate at which they produce radiation isn't constant over time. So we can't just say we'll leave the beam on for a minute because we can't accurately know how much dose will come out the other end during this time, the way we would with a radioactive source or a superficial X-ray unit. But determining how much radiation to deliver in terms of monitor units is quite accurate even with an inconsistent dose rate. That's why linear accelerators use monitor chambers, when isotope units and many superficial units do not. The monitor chamber is divided up into two sections. Each provides its own independent measure of the amount of radiation passing through the treatment head. This is because if the monitor chamber system as a whole broke and stopped recording signal, the beam wouldn't turn off after we deliver the required amount of radiation, and we'd keep irradiating the patient and give them a massively high dose. Having two of them means that if one breaks, the other one will turn the beam off at around about the right time. In practice, we have one chamber that does the work most of the time, and another one that's set to turn the beam off at a dose 10% higher than the primary chamber, so that if something goes wrong, there's something there to catch it. Each chamber is also split into four sections. This allows it to determine if the beam is pointing in the right direction. Since it's aimed electronically, its direction can vary slightly, but the monitor chamber measures signal independently in each of these four regions. So it knows that if the signal on this side in these two regions goes up, and the signal on the opposite side in these two regions goes down, that the beam is moved this way, and the machine is able to steer the beam back on course. The chamber underneath is divided up in a similar way, except at a 90 degree angle to the first, so it's able to pick up changes in the beam in the other direction. So if the signal in these two regions goes up, and the signal in these two regions goes down, that means that the beam has moved this way, and the machine is able to steer it back on course again. So the monitor chamber makes sure the patient gets the right amount of radiation and makes sure that the beam is pointed in the right direction. Underneath the monitor chamber is a very thin angled mirror. We shine a light onto it from the side and that allows us to produce a beam of visible light that follows the same path as a radiation beam. Because we can't actually see the radiation and you don't want to be in the room when it's on. So we use this light field instead in order to see where the radiation is going to hit a patient so we can point it at the right spot. Linear accelerators use three levels of beam collimation or shaping. The primary collimator is a thick tungsten block with a hole in it to let the beam out. It determines how big the beam is allowed to be, so the maximum field size, since the beam can't be bigger than this fixed hole. It also helps to stop scattered radiation from escaping from the treatment head. Beneath this we have the secondary collimator, or jaws, which are essentially four mobile rectangular radiation shields which are quite thick and made of metal. They're movable and allow us to make square and rectangular fields. I've drawn here two jaws, or one set, but actually the new accelerator would have two sets of jaws one set above the other. These jaws can move independently, so they can make any square or rectangular beam shape within the bounds of the maximum field size. The jaw movement is said to be focused, meaning that they move in a circular path such that their edge is always parallel to the path of the beam. This helps to keep the beam edge nice and sharp, since if the jaws followed a flat, non-focused path, 
their edges wouldn't be parallel to the beam's direction of travel, and some photons would travel further through the jaw than others. This means that the face of the jaw would not block the beam off cleanly. Photons that travel only a short distance through the jaw would contribute dose to the edge of the field, which would result in a wider beam edge. But if the edge of the jaw is focused like this, photons travel the same distance through the jaw, so the edge of the beam is quite narrow. We often call this part of the beam the penumbra, so we say that a focused jaw allows for a narrow beam penumbra. There's also a third layer of collimation beneath the secondary collimator jaws, which we call the tertiary collimator. Secondary collimator jaws can only handle rectangular fields, and most treatment targets aren't rectangular, which can result in a lot of dose being delivered to tissues outside of the target without further collimation. Originally, this was achieved by using lead or low melting point alloy blocks to shape the beam. These are placed on trays beneath the secondary collimator jaws and arranged to block the field into the required shapes. This could be done by using generically shaped blocks, or by using blocks of low melting point alloy that can be cast into custom shapes on site. Generic blocks aren't terribly precise, but they're better than using the jaws alone. And making custom blocks can be time consuming and can be hazardous because it involves potentially working with toxic fumes. You also need to make a block tray for each beam, and each patient treatment will involve several beams, so it would involve a lot of trips into the treatment room to change blocking trays. They're also quite heavy, which can be an occupational health and safety risk to staff, and also a risk to the patient as well, since they hurt a lot when dropped. You can get quite good results using custom blocks, but they've been largely rendered obsolete by the invention of the multi-leaf collimator, which I'll be covering in detail in the next video. But briefly put, there are a set of collimator jaws that have been divided into small sections, or leaves, which can move independently. They allow us to produce electronically programmed beam shapes without staff having to change them manually. Much like low-energy x-rays, electrons scatter a lot in air. So if you want to get a nice, sharply defined radiation beam, you need to shape it close to the patient's skin. We do this using an electron applicator. It's mounted just below the treatment head, and it consists of a frame containing several layers of radiation shields, known as trimmers, and a slot in the end where you can define the beam shape using a custom-made metal shield. Just like the blocks I mentioned before, this is made out of a low melting point alloy. It's a block of metal containing a hole that shapes a beam to conform to a target. This sort of mounting allows the beam to be shaped about 5 centimeters away from the patient's skin. These trimmers account for the fact that electron beams scatter a lot, so any scattered electrons that might hit the patient outside of the field hit the trimmers instead. 